the second technical session on Defense and Strategic Studies for the 15th International Research Conference under the theme Global Trends. We have six eminent presenters here with us today to present their thoughts and ideas on our theme for the conference. Without a doubt, this will be an interesting and intellectual challenging session. I would like to call upon Mr. Viran Makumange, instructor in the Department of Strategic Studies to introduce the chairperson, Dr. George Wood, for the second technical session. Sir, over to you. Dr. Bhagya Senaratna, 
who will be talking about external compulsions of Sri Lanka's social economic crisis. Dr. Zainaratna is presently a postdoctoral fellow of Global Asia at the Center for Global Asia, New York University, in China. China. She is the first academic from both the Department of Strategic Studies and the General Surgeon of Kodanam Defense University to proceed on a postdoctoral fellowship. Dr. Zainaratna is also a senior lecturer in the Department of Strategic Studies here at the Defense University. She has served in several editorial boards, such as the Journal of Defense and Policy Analysis, published by the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, KDU, and the Defense and Security Journal, published by the Defense Services Command and Staff College, Sri Lanka, of which she was the editor in chief in 2021. And she has edited Pakistan Sri Lanka Relations, a story of friendship in 2017 with Muhammad Imran. We will also be having uh, presentations today on the paper Role of the International Community in Sri Lanka's Redemption from the Economic Crisis. We have Prasanna Gulavatana and Shihan Maharuf. He will be presenting. Yes. So Shihan will be presenting for us today. Uh, and if I were to introduce Prasanna as well, Prasanna is a final year undergraduate from the Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, following the BSc in Strategic Studies and IR. She pursued her studies at Holy Cross College, where she was also a head prefect in 2018. Currently, she is a research intern at the Institute of National Security Studies. Uh, Prasansa is well known at the university for prominence she holds in diverse roles of leadership, Toastmasters, ISEC, and Unilever Sparks. Her fields of interest are all branches of national security, diplomacy, peace and conflict resolution, human rights, strategic studies, and cyber security. And of course, to say a little bit about Shihan as well, Shihan Maharuf is a second year undergraduate from the Faculty of Law of KDU, who pursued his studies at Trinity College, Kandy, where he was head prefect in 2018, while being the recipient of the Dutchman Kapitana Gold Medal and the President's Scout Award in 2017. He worked as a research assistant at the Dutchman Kapitana Institute since 2018 and has published several publications in the field of law and diplomacy. His future aspirations are in the field of maritime security, diplomacy, international relations, human rights and defense studies. Next, we will be hearing on sports and diplomacy, strategic employment of sports for foreign policy and security from Trina Dalapati, who is a student of the MSc program in security and strategic studies here at KDU. He's a graduate of the University of Law and with a Bachelor of Science in International Relations. Subsequently, he completed a diploma, followed by a postgraduate diploma in diplomacy and world affairs at the Bangla America International Diplomatic Training Institute. His interests lie in the fields of Aliyah, diplomacy, security and strategic studies, and foreign policy. He also holds proficiency in French and Spanish languages. Currently, he works as a project coordinator at the International Organization for Migration, the United Nations Agency on Migration. Thereafter, we will be speak, hearing on the topic of the United Nations peacekeeping as one solution to address Sri Lanka's economic crisis. And this will be presented by Major Indika Patirana, a military officer with a blend of military and academic competencies, a professional caliber enshrined with a postgraduate diploma in conflict management and peace studies, a postgraduate diploma in public management and administration, a diploma in Ayurvedic, Panchakarma, and Remedial massage and diploma in psychological counseling. He studied at the Sri Lanka Military Academy and holds a master's in public management. His personal interests in exploring new technologies and conducting research. So we will be hearing from Major Kapilana. We will also be having the topic of Chinese health cooperation and attaining political hegemony in the global south. Anusha Ramasamy Nanuraja will be presenting on this. She has completed her viva for her master's in security and strategic studies. She has a bachelor's in political science and public policy from the University of Colombo, first class, and is currently reading for her PGD at the Geneva School of Business and Economics in Switzerland. She is interested in international relations, strategic studies, and reconciliation for further research activities as well. And last but by no means least, we will be hearing about the topic Achieving National Security and Sustainability of Sri Lanka in Integration of the Role of Lawfare and Warfare for Contemporary Armed Operations. We will be 
This paper has been prepared by Major Jatilaka, and this is Veronica. Uh, Major Jatilaka is a military officer with the Vendor Military and Academic Competencies. He has a postgraduate diploma in business management and marketing strategy and graduated in the discipline of management at the Sir John Patanawa Defence University. He graduated from the Defence and Staff College of Sri Lanka and holds a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Gloucester, pursuing interest in exploring new technologies in conducting research and gamification. Mrs. RMS Veronica is a professional accredited from the National Software Testing Qualifications Board as a certified software tester and currently works as a software quality engineer with the Pearson's Education Global. A professional enshrined with a postgraduate diploma in business management, she is a graduate in the discipline of industrial information technology from the Uber Velasa University and currently is reading for masters in business administration once again at the University of Gloucester, the United Kingdom. So, that's a little bit about all of our presenters today who have taken a lot of trouble to put uh, their papers together, to put their presentations together, and we've come to listen to them today. So, without further ado, may I invite Dr. Bhagya Sena Ratna, who will be speaking to us on external compulsions on Sri Lanka's social economic crisis. China, followed by India, as you can see here. 
creating a trade imbalance with each of these states. Moreover, Sri Lanka's apparel and trade uh, textile industry is also reliant on important raw materials such as yarn and fabric from China at a low cost to produce its merchandise. Now, I do want to acknowledge that there are several internal issues that give rise to Sri Lanka's economic crisis, um, that fiscal policy, erroneous decisions made, mismanagement of Sri Lanka's economy, excessive government spending, um, tax cuts from Fairy printing money to pay wages, and the list goes on. So, this is why we see um, some, these are some reasons why we see the country's inflation. Rising. We also received a large amount of assistance in the form of loans in 2019 to reconstruct the northern and eastern provinces, and some of these were, of course, in the form of grants, but most were in the form of loans to build landmarks, construct houses for the displays and infrastructure projects like highways, schools, and power plants. Now, in this figure from the Department of External Resources, you can see the breakdown of multilateral and bilateral um, loans Sri Lanka has received. Let's quickly move on to the assistance that we've received since the economic crisis. Immediately after Sri Lanka announced that it would be defaulting on its repayments, which ratings, for example, downgraded Sri Lanka to RD in May 2022. I examined the reactions and commitments five countries in Australia, China, India, Japan, and the United States made towards assisting Sri Lanka. In addition, I also appraised the commitments by multilateral organizations as they also have a crucial role to play in enabling Sri Lanka's economic recovery. India initially extended one billion USD credit line to buy urgently needed food and, uh, food and medicine. They also extended 500 million to purchase fuel and they also sent um, fuel shippers to us and also pledged another 16 million worth of humanitarian aid in the form of food, milk, powder, medicine. The US, for its part, provided 6 million USD in emergency assistance and thereafter provided 11.75 million in June and another 16 million USD um, in September during Samantha Papa's visit. Japan responded to Vikram Singh's call for an aid consulting and in August said that they would collaborate with Sri Lanka's creditors and find remedies that would enable Sri Lanka to overcome economic difficulties. In September, just not too long ago, the finance minister said they would discuss with credit nations and all credit nations to come for discussions um, to facilitate this, um, facilitate Sri Lanka overcome the crisis. They also provided say, um, 3 million USD as a grant, which will be dispersed to the ADP, the Asian Development Bank. Now, Australia has contributed an additional 25 million. Australian dollars through the World Food Program uh, to meet urgent food and healthcare needs. Now, this is in addition to the 23 million they are already giving Sri Lanka for our development purposes. Now, the World Food Program has said the first consignment of a uh, consisting of 600 metric tons of rice, pulses, and cooking oil is due to arrive in Sri Lanka soon. Now, the Chinese response, the fifth country I'm looking at is China. Their response is in stark contrast to that of the whole states mentioned before. The initial response was to offer another 1 billion USD as a loan to pay off existing loans, demonstrating that they were reluctant to restructure bilateral world loans. And um, the central bank of Sri Lanka said there is no preferential treatment for any country. They've also extended 1.5 billion USD and another 500 million uh, one of 74.75 USD worth of emergency uh, humanitarian assistance, such as medicine and rice food. So what's the role of 
regional and great part of competition in the present crisis. Now, the avoidance of India, Japan, China, and the United States basing Sri Lanka Burma, the first to interact with Ranavid from Singha when he first assumed the East as Prime Minister in May 2022. The interests indicate, especially um, that of Japan, India, United States, and Australia, indicate the role the port states are playing in Sri Lanka recovery from the financial crisis. In May 2022, on the sidelines of the port summit, both India and Japan expressed their interest in jointly working to assist Sri Lanka recover, and we also see Japan continuing to extend their support uh, by commencing staff level talks to restructure bilateral roles. Now, there is a lot of emphasis on what China's commitments would be, um, and all the four countries are really focusing their attention towards this because both Japan and China have 10% of Sri Lanka's debt. So what these countries would do is of, I think, the interest. So China's response is unexpected. They have even said that the 1.5 billion credit line they will give us, we will see 1.5 um, billion, will um, stop the negotiations still. Of course, um, the IMF negotiations are through. They want to see what's going to happen. But there is a possibility, ladies and gentlemen, of China restructuring the debt in Sri Lanka as they have been doing with Ecuador. So we will have to see what kind of action the other organization will take to see whether Sri Lanka will commence uh, discussions with um, China. Now, in some, um, China's comparative silence con contrasts with the support, particularly of uh, countries like Japan and India. And ultimately, the messaging has shown the eagerness of poor countries to reinforce their influence in China at a time, influence in Sri Lanka rather, at a time when China is showing hesitation. Um, Sri Lanka has also neglected its own national well being in attempting to appease other countries and their requirements in engaging uh, for individual profits, resulting in this social economic crisis. We also see the mishandling of uh, Northern Ireland policy, uh, which resulted us being entangled in the test of the reunification region. So, when these powers were able to use Sri Lanka for their own gain in the competition for power, uh, Sri Lankan leaders have miscalculated its economic development and the needs of its people. These are some of the primary references that I have used and would be a for obvious reasons I'm unable to indicate all of them. Um, these are my contact details. You are most welcome to reach out to me should you have any questions. Thank you. Session Chair, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I consider the privilege to be able to present alongside my students and I'm sending this recording in advance in case I'm unable to present personally due to work coming from that new Right. So, um, we will now go to our second paper today, which is on the role of the international community in Sri Lanka's redemption from the economic crisis. Now, this will be presented by Shivan Bharuf, Shivan Bharuf. Uh, this very research that we've authored 
is not just addressing the tip of the iceberg, but more than addressing what's evidently visible on the surface. It goes above and beyond the, those tangible elements to address the actual threat and to see where the root problems exist in order to uh, arrive at this crisis. So without further ado, let me move on uh, to the background of my research or our research. So uh, the economic crisis in Sri Lanka is considered as the first crisis faced by this country in decades. And it is oblivion that it has seen a lot of problems that the common men and women are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. We face the 30-year-old war and we are facing right now problems that we did not face during those times. Now that exemplifies how great the country has fallen. So initially we brought, uh, we narrowed down our topic in YouTube. First is the economic crisis in Sri Lanka, that's what I just explained. And the next is the role of the international community. So in order to understand what the international community is, we, all, we have to fo uh, pay more focus on the actors of the international community. And also we have to understand initially in this research that both Sri Lanka as well as international actors have to take into deep consideration the fact that the role the international community has to play in this regard is very pivotal, is extremely pivotal in determining where Sri Lanka ends up in the upcoming years. So initially we have an analysis on the role the regional actors will be performing in terms of Sri Lanka's redemption from the economic crisis. And uh, as it is mentioned on our slides, it is predominantly India's credit line and the Indian uh, aid that Sri Lanka relied on predominantly throughout the past few months. And we can also see China putting in with its contribution. And as Madam Bhatia mentioned slightly before, it's rather surprising to see the shift of events from the Sri Lankan government as to how we shifted from uh, a pro Chinese reliant approach to suddenly to shift from to another approach. And I would also like to mention uh, the contribution from the Asia Development Bank and especially the JFPR, the Japan, the Japan Fund for Prosperous and Resilient. Uh, resident Asia and the Pacific. So the important thing and the significant contribution, the significant power that these kind of initiatives carry is that they have the ability to, to act against them and make sure that they, these types of crises, they come up with the best solutions at hand. Rather than individual actors, rather than individual nation states, these initiatives that are more focused on specific problems have the capacity to contribute at, direct, at a time of dialing. That is something that we were able to understand during our research. Now moving on to the role of the international organizations. So if we've been very alert to news on social media or maybe even in mass media, one of the most prominent or one of the most top discussed debated topics was the IMF. What the IMF is doing and what the Sri Lankan government is doing with the IMF in order to get what we got from the IMF. So if we closely understand and if we closely analyze what the IMF has told, the second point, structural reforms to address corruption vulnerabilities. And also the World Bank has stated that before it provides new financing, it is working closely with implementing agencies to establish robust controls and fiduciary oversight to ensure these resources reach the poorest and the most vulnerable. One of the key points that surfaced in the wake of the economic crisis was the fact that these initiatives that spark from international organization end up being prone to corruption and political capture. Now it's something that's very important that Sri Lankans have to understand and also the international community has to understand. It is not just the provision of funds and aids at time of time, but also ensuring that these funds are used for the actual purpose. Now that is something that we were able to identify as a critical point in our research. I would also like to mention about the UNICEF and the UN Development Program, which supports the Sri Lankan government to adopt universal social protection programs, which provide benefits to everyone in special categories, and to make sure that uh, marginalized groups do not end up further marginalized in the wake of this economic crisis. And another factor that I wanted to highlight is the XMP plan, 
the Union Sustainable Development Group's joint humanitarian needs and priorities plan, which was launched in coordination with development and humanita uh, humanitarian partners in Sri Lanka. The unique factor about the HMP plan is that it recognizes that without immediate intervention, the multiple crises facing Sri Lanka today could escalate into a broader humanitarian crisis. We've seen this happen in other parts of the world, specifically in the African region. But the identification, the recognition of HMP of this very factor is a key indicator that we have to act sooner than later. That's what's very important. And immediate action and immediate intervention at the wake of this crisis is extremely important to avoid further expansion of the economic crisis. Moving on to austerity measures. What's important to understand is that austerity measures are a dire need at this time of crisis. But it has to be fair and most of all reasonable. We saw in Greece and Spain how these austerity measures led to you know, less access and affordability for healthcare and also immediate and emergency requirements. Now this cannot happen in the Sri Lankan context. If this happens in a Sri Lankan context, the consequences would be more adverse. Because Sri Lanka being a third world country, if the poor and marginalized community face obstacles in access to healthcare, that could result in chaos. So any and all austerity measures introduced to Sri Lanka must be based on a human rights approach. It has to be assessed on a human rights approach. We've already faced a lot of uh, accusations in terms of human rights violation that uh, claims that we are not meeting the standards for providing space for peaceful assembly and peaceful expression. Now, those cannot exist. And most importantly, the strict austerity measures should only be temporary. And we have to be very mindful of who is being affected by these measures and at what cost. Economic redemption true, but at what cost? Is it at the cost of the rights of the common people? That is of pivotal importance and specifically in terms of the role that the international community has to play. That close monitoring is important in providing the right guideline and pathway to Sri Lanka to redeem from this economic crisis. Now, this is also a very interesting topic. Economic renaissance, an opportunity, to assist, an opportunity to assist or to exploit. Now, the talk of the town for the past decade, I would say, is the last point that I highlighted here. The democratic democracy and what China has been doing, specific, uh, specifically in South Asia, given its regional interests. Now, this is a topic which is very controversial, which has been subjected to a lot of debate. Now, our focus is not if it is right or wrong, if it exists or not exists. But the main focus is, if it does exist by any means, if at all it exists, it should not. And these are numbers that we've indicated about the Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka's borrowings and Sri Lanka's debts in percentages. And we should understand that there is a need where we need to restructure our debts. That immediate, immediate provision of further loans will really result in further entanglement of Sri Lanka's economic crisis. The only way out is immediate debt reforms and restructuring of the debts that Sri Lanka is currently facing right now. Now, we, I, all, I initially mentioned at the beginning of my presentation that we are focusing on a multi-dimensional approach in this presentation, in this research. Not just what the international community has to do, but for the international community to do something there is a role that the Sri Lankan state has to play. There's always two sides of the point. And for the international community to be able to perform their duties, the role that the state has to play also has to be in line. Now, we've understood that the key driver of Sri Lanka's economic crisis is the extremely low tax rates, which unfortunately end up benefiting uh, the various of the Sri Lankan population. And it, it, it has been made evident that the powerful commercial interests have been loaded the tax base for years and in many cases exempt from paying any corporate tax leaving the government increasingly reliant, reliant on borrowing including its service uh, including the service its debt. So this cannot happen anymore. And the tax cuts that happened in 2019 evidently led to a GDP ratio of around 8% which was one of the lowest in the whole wide world. So it is of importance for us to understand that we have to come up with measures to make sure that these do not exist at least in the near future. Now we saw the measures taken by the existing regime that 2019 tax cuts, some of them were reversed, 
but we have to also ensure that it does not, any other further measure should not burden the lower income either. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, an expert saying from the United, United Nations experts, it, it has urged the government to guarantee the fundamental rights of peaceful aspirants I mentioned earlier. And uh, another important factor that we wanted to highlight is the Universal Social Protection Program recommended by the United Nations Development Program and UNICEF. It, it suggests that these, if we follow those approaches, it would avoid the staggering error rates and systematic corruption that has undermined the efficacy of Sri Lanka's main safety net program, Samundi. So these safety net programs that exist in terms of Samundi in the local level are prone to a lot of corruption and are prone to problems that exist in the grassroots levels. In order to overcome these problems from the grassroots level itself, it is important that Sri Lanka is open and receptive of ideas that come from organizations such as the United Nations. And the role that such organizations play in guiding the Sri Lankan community is very important for us as Sri Lankans in order to progress in the international arena. And this would be the recommendations that we present at the end of our research. Initially, all the, the whole of the international community has to work with the International Monetary Fund to encourage a realistic bailout package that imposes conditions that address corruption and a global bureaucracy but does not add unnecessarily to the daily burdens of the common citizen. And also, from through the package to allow the country to buy food and fertilizer to ensure a decent harvest this case in the immediate future. And most of all, encourage Sri Lanka's major creditors, Japan, China, and the Asia Development Bank, to reschedule and further forgive some of the debt coming that is due now and in the immediate future. I know this is very this is a huge step. But with a lot of negotiation and with the right level of diplomacy involved, it is always possible. And finally, in terms of humanitarian assistance, to tie the uh, country over during its current shortages with immediate relief, it's evidently going to lower the temperature of the demonstrators and offer some hope for a better future. Now, another factor that we highlighted was using Sri Lanka as a test for the countries that have already developed. We know that there are similar problems that arise in the rest of the world. And usage of Sri Lanka as a test mechanism to be able to understand the consequences and the context and apply it to other countries would be of much benefit for the international community. Once political stability loves, encourage tourism, which is evidently the most immediate source of hard currency for the Sri Lankan economy. And specifically in a Sri Lankan context, it is very much inevitable. Tourism is one of the key aspects that would bail out Sri Lanka from this economic crisis. And another important factor that I wanted to highlight is sports diplomacy, which was uh, it was not pioneered solely by the of Australia, but what happened uh, during the last Australian cricket tour to Sri Lanka, where they partnered with the of Australia to raise public awareness and also contributed their prize money from the tournament, entirely to the Sri Lankan uh, the fund raised by the of Australia. So these measures through sports, where Sri Lanka is specifically known for cricket and a lot of emergence raising up in these days, this sports diplomacy factor could be utilized in favor of Sri Lanka, specifically with, with help and the role played by the international community to assist us in this with the imagine. So this is a key takeaway from our presentation. Finally, to conclude, it is evident that Sri Lanka faces the prospects of years of predation and scarcity, but it has strengths as well as an educated workforce, a social safety net, and a long history of democratic governance. If at all the international community needs to help Sri Lanka, they have to build on these strengths and try to prevent another descent into self-destruction. We saw what happened 30 years ago and we don't want it to happen once more. Now that is why we need the role of the international community to be performed at the right level. And to finally highlight a multidimensional approach that has to be pursued by all actors of the international community. As I initially mentioned, it's not just the tip of the iceberg that we are planning to address, that we have to address, but also the underlying threat, the actual threat and the deep roots of the problem that has been caused. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation and these are the references that we were able to refer throughout our presentation. And uh, thank you, please uh, attend here and uh, we are always open for any questions and inquiries about the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shreem. So you brought us to a point where you started talking about sports diplomacy and Trina is going to take us through that next. 
Today we are speaking about sports and diplomacy, strategic employment of sports for foreign policy and security. Here I have 
focus mainly on sports, uh, uh, sports mega competitions, case studies from South Africa and the Rugby World Cup in 1995 and further examples from Berlin Olympics 1936, Moscow 1980, Beijing 2008 and the notion of new Argentina by former President Juan Ferrer. Secondly, uh, secondly, how states have been more encouraged to use soft power or hard power means today, highlighting that sports is commonly perceived as soft power means that is used by states today. Thirdly, sports as a way of signaling foreign policy shifts between hostile states. Uh, for example, these range from the ping pong diplomacy, India, Pakistan, North and South Korea, and also Japan and South Korea. Next, I observe how sporting movements and federations carry the potential to influence governments. Representation, where sports represent a common language, breaking barriers between different societies. Sports as a lifestyle, how sports have become a part of daily life with the rise of TV and media industry. And finally, how sports allow countries to gain global recognition. This is because mere membership in bodies like UN might not always translate into recognition or acceptance by the global community, especially for small states. In what ways states have practiced sports, uh, sports as a tool of diplomacy to achieve different policy objectives? Firstly, how sports have been used in soft power strategies by states. Next, sporting personalities as diplomats or ambassadors. Here, uh, I brought in a special focus on Sri Lanka's World Cup winning team in 1996, which put Sri Lanka in the world map. Thirdly, how sports create equal societies and bring about social cohesion. This is mainly because sports carry the capacity to break barriers since it levels the playing field. Fourthly, how sports bring national unity and collective identity, where sports is one factor that can unite a country regardless of race, religion, culture or political views. And uh, finally, sports to, uh, sports to show displeasure of opinion. Here I brought in the classic example of sporting boycotts as a strategy and low-cost uh, way to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, show, uh, uh, to show your feelings towards states and organizations. In the second part of my analysis, as you have observed, uh, the strategic employment of sports requires first to understand the strategic environment of the state. And to achieve both foreign policy and security objectives, it entails streamlining sports as a root component. Uh, in strategic employment of sports for foreign policy, firstly, sports relationships can lead to strategic alliances of states. Uh, for example, the friendship treaties between East Germany and Soviet Union in 1966 and 1977 were based on sports, but they represented a wider political, uh, political ideology. Second, sports, uh, uh, sports as a means of easing tension between hostile states. Here, I highlighted the case study between Turkey and Armenia. Uh, sports can be strategically employed as an economic tool of foreign policy. This may happen between both friendly and rival states. For example, France used sports as a medium to provide aid to their former colonies in Africa during the 1960s. On the other hand, uh, following Russia's war in Ukraine, the FIFA and UEFA sanctioned Russian teams from competing in the World Cup, which led to a lot of problems in TV rights and a loss of currency for Russia. On the final point, I brought the case study of China, how China influenced the third world through sports which, uh, which led to the support of developing states to recognize China PRC as a representative uh, for China in Olympics, replacing Taiwan to rename it as Chinese Taiwan. In strategic employment of sport for security, relationships and understandings reached through sports can lead to creation or strengthening of military alliances. Secondly, how confrontation through sport can bring deterrence or balance of power between rival states. For the third point, 
I brought in the classic example of NATO policies during the Cold War uh, to uh, uh, during the Cold War to the East German athletes by denying them visa uh, to participate in sporting competitions. Is an example of how sports can be strategically employed in alliances or forums related to security. In terms of economic security, my fellow representative also brought this point uh, in the final slide. Uh, uh, sports relationship can uh, lead to debts, grants and investment. I'm nearing my uh, 10 minutes, so let me conclude. To recap, the, this research explored the relationship between sports and diplomacy and the strategic employment of sports for foreign policy and security. Firstly, the research uh, uh, found a strong connection between sports and diplomacy in several key dimensions. Secondly, it observed how states have been using sports in diplomacy. But however, the need to widen the scope of diplomacy today warrant sports to be viewed as a modern strategic element. Based on this premise, thirdly, the research explored the strategic employment of sports to achieve foreign policy and security objectives of a state. The research determined that while sport is often used in diplomacy, the strategic employment of sports can propel state strategy beyond diplomacy and influence other elements of national power. It is understood that sports have the propensity to carry an aura of hard power, contrary to, to the popular notion that uh, sports is soft power. In this way, sports can be strategically employed as both, and, uh, as both hard and soft power means for foreign policy and security, making it a smart power element. There are some points to reflect upon. We can always reevaluate the significance of sports and diplomacy and uh, states to rethink and re-employ sports as a part of their strategy and statecraft. Sports as a distinctive state strategy or as a distinctive part of strategic foreign policy. Sports diplomacy must be considered a separate policy rather than a component under public or cultural diplomacy. And we all understand that further investigation is needed on sports and diplomacy because it is an area that is not uh, much study in the field of strategic studies and IR. Sports have certainly uh, transformed from Asian times and today is an arena for power, strategy and statecraft. We need to understand the true potential of sports and its strategic employment which will allow the state to emerge from global complexities in a transforming international system. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for your presence and kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. We will now hear from Major Indika Patilana, who will be speaking to us on the contribution of the United Nations mission on the economic crisis situation. Sorry for the technical. Okay, uh, good morning, distinguished English providers. 
Thank you so much uh, for your, the part that you offered for me to start. Uh, need a humble to present this topic on this part of the day, then uh, maybe I ask you to Before I move into the topic, I would like to ask a question from the audience. Do you think is there any crisis right now happening in Sri Lanka? Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. Why it is, uh, in my case, I will take you to two parts. In from one side, this crisis happened because of the external factors in two others, and the other part, it is also influenced by internal factors. When it comes, when it comes to external factors, you can see like globalization, uh, the Ukraine Russian conflicts right now which is happening and also the pandemic and many more cases you can But when it comes to internal factors, what you can see is Sri Lanka starting from the Easter Sunday bomb attacks, followed by the COVID-19 pandemic, this was issue for uh, this was maybe issue for this economic crisis which is right now happening in the country. Though that you can understand this is neither by external factors or a, uh, no internal factors by combination of both. As you all know, Sri Lanka is a country which has a tiny economy. Why I would prefer refer it to a tiny economy? It's we are having an import led production chain economy. As an example, in case you want to manufacture sign, you need to import raw materials from other countries, which means import and export interconnected. Also, high dependence of foreign remittance, tourism, and which have poor high vulnerability in Sri Lanka during past few time. Current discourse related to the defense, security, and the military personnel are not good in the country. Thereby, various stakeholders are making comments on demilitarizing, dissolving, or reducing the military in order to overcome this challenge. However, rather reducing or dissolving or taking negative reforms, I trust by my research I would come with kind of positive and uh, options in order to solve this matter which right now happening in Sri Lanka. Even until yesterday, I also see this as a crisis. But I am listening to an inaugural session uh, by welcome speech of the Vice Chancellor during the IRC 2022 and the keynote speaker's speech. Uh, it also changed my mind to see this as an more of an opportunity rather than a crisis because uh, it is a challenge rather than merely becoming a crisis where there are a number of opportunities open for Sri Lankans to come up and to address this issue. If we have come out, we have to think differently and act positively. Rather saying crisis, crisis, crisis always. Now this is a high time for us to come out and to change and perform well. These are some of the limitations that I have come across during my presentation, the study. And, uh, as the latest update, Sri Lanka is having around 179,000 soldiers who in the army. Also, when it comes to the tribe processes, all there are, there are approximately 270,000 soldiers are occupied, deployed at Sri Lanka for security purposes. When it comes to these people, the best thing is they are well trained and skillful and result oriented people, which we have shown during the last two decades. I admit that the fact that per head expenditure for a soldier is not a small amount, but as a country, it is of course important to maintain or uh, have as armed forces in order to continue the national security. By engaging in UN, 
missions, it further declares that the burden imposed on the expenditure by the Treasury can be maintained by sending troops to the UN in a, up to a certain level. When country reached the IMF, as you all know yesterday also, IMF reveals that Sri Lanka is having more than 50% of debts belongs to China and now they are facing doubt how Sri Lanka can be, you know, about the, uh, all this foreign exchange. So, in the IMF also, in the initial draft, they are suggesting Sri Lanka to reduce or demilitarize or dissolve the military in order to uh, find out the solutions. However, the, how these challenges can be converted to opportunity? This is the best thing what we need to know. Since we have completed three decades of war, we can guarantee that we have well-trained, skillful, result-shown and result-oriented military personnel where we can utilize to perform in this international level. As you can see this in the graph, uh, since 1990 up to now, UN missions have increased by 50% of speed than ever before, which means the conflicts around the world is becoming more and more and it is it will be a kind of a major threat in the future days. But who is the authority that, that, that can address this one? Right now, UN peacekeeping is one of the best solutions that we have to in order to maintain security and peace around the world. It also has a problem. What is the doubt? So they need to have human resources, skillful human resources, which they can utilize for this matter. Right now, as a standpoint, blue helmets, which we call UN peacekeeping operations, are the options that world have. And also, for that, Requirement human resource is becoming more and more general. When it comes to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka has deployed UN peacekeeping operations in three countries Lebanon, South Sudan, and also in Mali. There are 436 soldiers we have employed in UN peace operations, which it comes to the present day only 0.2. When you consider the world, you can say I have taken three countries. You might be surprised why I have taken only these three countries. Because these are the countries which I have in our region. And by looking at this, you can see how Bangladesh employed the UN peace cooperation. More than 6,608. It is a huge amount when it comes to lump sum of money. Dollars. Also in Pakistan, when it comes to Pakistan, they also have employed more than 4,700 soldiers in UN peacekeeping. You might be asked, okay, why? What is the what is the doubt of India? Okay, India is still India is a kind of a stable economy right now, but still they are employing UN peacekeeping in order to still gain some uh, some some of lump sum of dollars to their country. By knowing that UN peacekeeping operations are one of the best options to gain dollars to their account. If they can, why we can't? Is the UN have any specialty? Or if the UN not consider the population of the country, if the UN not you know specialize the size of the country, if the UN didn't ask anything, having that much capable resources. Why we don't employ it? It is the doubt that we have. As you know, we are having the great cause that we have good reputation around the world. After the 2009, even our soldiers have not fired any single bullet or the terrorism. There are some excep exceptional cases that we have, we have at night, but due to this terrorism, they have never fired a single bullet after 2009. So we can prove that we have kind of a capable and very reputed soldiers with our military by right now. 
Then, when it comes to the uh, invest, how can we invest these soldiers? That that would be uh, one of the most important point. Where since we have we need not need to pay any sense to retrain them, and they have already been trained. So they are with the, all the skills and all the knowledge to perform in the United Nations. So soldiers can be invested in United Peace Keeping Operations as one of the best investment ever. Also, we uh, know that you, when it comes to UN missions, they are paying for each and every equipment or soldier we bring to their all the operations from our country. So what will happen if we expend some amount? In order to begin this, so same amount will be repeated. Uh, we will take back from the UN mission operation. So that will uh, that will be other one of the best options. There will be only zero expenditure for us to employ in the UN missions, where we can have a number of good solutions rather than uh, going for the different solutions right now. And then, in order to conclude this, I would like to say like this. Do we need to drop down from the existing level or status quo, or else we need to go for solutions? So I would, I would prefer, I would recommend. This is one of the best short-term and practical strategy. Why I say this is a practical strategy? We have already all the requirement with us. We need only to employ, deploy them in the operations where UN missions are offering us to employ or deploy. Because we, if we deploy these soldiers in the short term, we can get lump sum of dollars from the uh, international operations, where we can address this the major crisis that right now Sri Lanka is facing. And this will be a win-win situation. How it can be a win-win situation is when we employ. Deploy our uh, the soldiers in the UN peacekeeping operations. In one side, one side the UN could control this the uh, national security, the international security around the world, as well as we will be benefited by economically. And also, our soldiers will get more international opportunities rather uh, being into the country. An ideal way of using human resources. You know, uh, when we employ the, as as right now, Sri Lanka is gaining uh, the major income, major foreign income is Middle East employees, where it makes number of social countries due to lack of experiences, and the, since they don't have any training, there are number of social countries we are facing right now. But rather going for that kind of solutions, why we can't deploy these people in the United Nations? And having such trained skills and resource-oriented, results-oriented people, we are keeping them inside us, rather keeping and making them part in the uh, deployments. Before I wind up my sessions, I would like to take you one statement made by this uh, Madeleine Reese during the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She has called troop contributing countries get an awful lot of money from the UN was sending troops. Don't misunderstand this awful word. I know when I say this, most of you all get into kind of a different idea. But in here, what she is referring to, having these kind of opportunities to have the foreign exchange or remittance, why we are struggling for different solutions. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind, patient listening. And these are the references that I have used during my presentation. Good luck. Have a nice day. Thank you. So next we will be hearing on Chinese health cooperation and attaining critical hegemony in the global south. Anusha Nadaraja will be presenting. this opportunity for making this happen today. Um, uh, so first of all, uh, my topic is rather literally about broader, so I would like to narrow down the presentation. Um, so let me go deep in. Uh, 
So, so my presentation will be like uh, uh, sorted down as well. And uh, this is my introduction. For for example, Voka is usually used to have a lot of um, like power to have and hold hegemony to control the world and conquer the world. But anyway, the Chinese health cooperation during the COVID-19 has showed a plenty of uh, opportunities like that, how China was able and capable of making use of cooperative mechanism in a different way. For example, I use the word uh, the state-centered extraverted cooperation mechanism to identify the Chinese health cooperation mechanism throughout my study in this process. So, uh, basically, my problem statement would be uh, uh, the Chinese health cooperation strategy is used as a much state-centric state extraverted approach by China to compete for the global hegemony power position by dominating in the global south during the COVID-19 period and how they conquered it uh, during the study. So, these are the methodologies. And my literature review showed me that um, there are plenty of arguments that the realistic point of view, the realist point of view, that war or power made the position of uh, hard uh, hegemony. But unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, China has made it's a good example to make corporate patient mechanism to uh, create kind of influence or country and create acceptance uh, during the, uh, throughout the COVID-19 period. And it was not just a uh, Chinese tactic, but it's their choice. And I argue this is a grand strategy of China to become a political hegemony of the world, especially by conquering the global south in the recent past. So, when it comes to uh, the detection of findings, paper has three different categories. First one is uh, like explains about how the international cooperation and soft power as means of attaining political hegemony. Secondly, I argue and explain about the tactics, uh, tactics and methods. Finally, I give a conclusion how the methods and techniques have been utilized to conquer the uh, global south during COVID-19 pandemic via health cooperation to attain each money, especially by like uh, receiving acceptance and influence in the region. So, I define state-centric extraverted cooperation uh, under five main categories. One thing. Uh, according to Lovitz, when, when it comes to uh, attaining hegemony, you have to make it in a way of cooperation or uh, a peaceful concern. So, um, uh, meantime, sovereign authority is needed by country to uphold and spread their influence and make countries to accept whatever the, uh, the core of it, uh, core uh, implements or who wanted to be happen in the ground level. So, one of the main arguments from the realist perspective in terms of uh, cooperation is not a meaningful way of attaining hegemony is there is no sovereign authority. But uh, during COVID-19 pandemic by implementing the health cooperation, China was successfully uh, made that China is one of the sovereign authority to make use of and spread its side uh, towards its territory, especially the global south. And it made use of uh, uh, health cooperation to all the behavior, especially the political behavior of certain countries, especially in the Latin America and uh, including in South Asia. So when it's come to uh, South Asia, China was, capable, so China was able to uh, overtake the uh, Indian uh, kind of vaccine um, diplomacy and spread its uh, uh, vaccination or vaccine uh, distribution throughout all the South Asian context. Uh, the third one is uh, it used the exist existing networks such as uh, the BRI and economic institutions such as ADPI to implement 
Uh, we help cooperate in every country, and with uh, mostly every country in the global south. For example, uh, the Chinese embassies especially have a labor control, and uh, the Chinese enterprises such as such as Alibaba played an immense role in taking part of health cooperation, especially like sharing and uh, like distributing Chinese uh, vaccines, um, PPP kits, and all. Uh, finally, uh, China has used a hybrid method. For example, China has used modern and uh, a traditional uh, combined hybrid method in order to implement its uh, health cooperation in the global south. Meantime, China has used the soft power instead of hard power, such as military needs, to com um, implement its uh, uh, implemented. Uh, health cooperation to gain acceptance as one of the global donor, especially on health sector, and to reinforce uh, their uh, influence in the global south. Um, so when it's come to, uh, the, uh, when it comes to all of this uh, Chinese health cooperation, uh, technically Chinese health cooperation was uh, initiated with PRI, and, uh, but, but it was initiated uh, in 2017 in terms of like broadening and uh, expanding its missions, especially in abroad. Uh, but um, meantime, it, it, the special focus of the uh, health cooperation was in uh, Global South because of its peripheral needs and Chinese requirement to protect its influence in South. So uh, by implementing Chinese health cooperation, China become a new medical donor, which is something very new uh, apart from whatever the Western Foundation. And secondly, China is day track. For example, uh, during the health cooperation, China did not only like uh, distribute its uh, uh, medical assistance. Meantime, it has supported economically. For example. China uh, immensely supported the South uh, African continent and uh, South Asia, Latin America. Uh, unfortunately, it has, it has a lot of uh, support uh, received from South African context because of its uh, uh, economic support uh, during the COVID-19 to build up their nation after uh, COVID-19 hit. The third one is China proved itself that it is a responsible and solution oriented state and it's come to responding to the emergency global issues. This is one of the main uh, important and main uh, aspect in terms of political hegemony where countries, the readiness of countries to address, uh, address problematic issues where most of the Western countries have failed to support the global south. During COVID-19, China played a key role in terms of supporting all of these countries. And these supports have been come up as multiple ways. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a free donation, it's not a free uh, medical donation, but it's an economic support as well as its support which was given to China in terms of uh, uh, diplomatic renewal with most of the countries. So uh, China has Wasted four different uh, tactics. First one is the state centric approach uh, and binding authority. For example, China created binding authority by uh, implementing the COVID, uh, uh, health cooperation during COVID 19 graph. China has invested in many countries, especially on the health sectors. For example, UAE is one of the first countries to accept Chinese vaccines and uh, China uh, and it gave a territory or a land, piece of land to test and produce its uh, vaccine kits uh, in, 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 within the territory. We can, it has implemented a uh, neighboring diplomacy, so it's not a partnering diplomacy, it's neighboring diplomacy where China doesn't take any sort of uh, uh, responsibility such as how NATO take responsibility for protect, protect its, uh, in, uh, protects its member countries. China doesn't take any sort of responsibility or commitments to um, towards the participating countries. So China is free, of, uh, free in terms of uh, responding to the particular individual needs. So China is totally independent in the, in the sense 
they can do whatever they wanted uh, in terms of uh, their health cooperation. So, uh, along with the um, Silk Road and Space Silk Road, China has implemented the Health Silk Road concept uh, throughout the health cooperation. So, we can see the entire global stuff has been covered up by this health cooperation. Uh, this one, I would say that one of the main reasons of uh, the focus on global south is one thing, China, uh, global south is one of the important uh, places for China. Second thing, most of the western countries were not in the position to help the global south when it comes to addressing the health crisis during COVID-19. Third thing, and uh, during the, uh, the hype of COVID-19 deaths, now the Western countries has the antidote, while China the first responded to the uh, COVID-19 issues. China has uh, started implementing and providing its knowledge with most of the countries to identify uh, the special needs of uh, certain countries in terms of addressing the effects of COVID-19. And China implemented soft power, so this is one of the main important things where I would say China used its army to distribute um, COVID-19 kits uh, during its mass when they implemented the mass dis diplomacy. So China has showed a different phase of um, 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 like the attaining political hegemony to peaceful means rather than like implementing any sort of military interventions or military engagement with countries to achieve sort of uh, uh, acceptance and influence. So when it's come to the methods, so as I mentioned earlier, China has used traditional as well as hybrid methods. So when it's come to traditional methods, uh, China used the international norm, for example, uh, when China was hit by COVID-19, most of the countries have supported China and China never uh, rejected it, being a capable country to handle whatever the outcomes of COVID-19. Meantime, China supported the other countries as the reciprocal to support them as an international law. So, it, it, has, it has showed that they are capable of conducting international relations by adopting all these international norms. Secondly, they have uh, implemented, uh, implemented the bilateral and multilateral discussions prior to the uh, implementation of uh, health cooperation. For example, the, the Chinese President Xi himself uh, uh, like voluntarily has started conversations with many other countries to implement this uh, for, uh, health cooperation as part of this uh, health, health cooperation policy. So they have used propaganda methods uh, for example, mostly in, in, in the history of China, the Twitter and Facebook have been widely used by the Chinese diplomats to convey Chinese uh, support and Chinese uh, health cooperation, especially their distribution, their donation, etc. So it was like uh, media propaganda, uh, propaganda was widespread and it was really worked well to all to be the negative idea which was spread by the Western uh, world uh, to in terms of the birth of uh, COVID-19 in China. So when it comes to modern method, as I mentioned earlier, China used its military to spread soft power influence. For example, it has used to uh, uh, distribute masks and it has been employed in a certain places where in uh, Africa to support the need of uh, COVID-19 effects. And Chinese vaccine mobilization was uh, given in the name of uh, 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 China announced its vaccines as uh, public goods, which which is one of the most important indicators of Chinese health diplomacy. Uh, Chinese health diplomacy, where it showed that uh, health is equal to everyone. So um, there is no nothing uh, uh, like, for example, there's nothing was mentioned of the rights of medication or the prices of uh, its, uh, its uh, staffs of uh, health workers and all. And effective media strategy have been used in especially in Latin America. For example, a number of languages have been used in Latin America to propagate Chinese health uh, distribution, donations and all. And uh, China have used a lot of uh, actors, including 
uh, it sparks a Chinese uh, Xinjiang provinces that have been used and uh, a lot of hospitals uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Chinese uh, investors, Chinese uh, embassies have been used to propagate the Chinese idea of health cooperation to spread its influence and create acceptance. Uh, when it comes to the effects of the tactics and methods, uh, one of the important uh, factor of hegemony is to address the preconditions to attain political hegemony. So China has used the preconditions of COVID-19 to create the importance and need of China as a responsible great power to address and to uh, like refer to an alternative power. Uh, instead of the Western country. So this has been one of the connotations which is uh, uh, widely argued where China is uh, successfully victorious, successfully victorious over the uh, uh, counter attacks of the, uh, Western health, uh, or Western health diplomacy and uh, its criticism to conquer and to like uh, firmly uh, showcase its ability to support the people worry me and uh, to address the uh, global crisis. And it played a wide uh, role in all different political behaviors of participating countries. For example, in Brazil, even though the president uh, of Brazil was not happy about giving and granting a permission, granting place of testing uh, Chinese vaccines, China had been uh, used China has used its influence to convince uh, the president to uh, take part of uh, take their research activities in Brazil. And in um, this has been gradually existed, it changes the political preferences of participating countries. So over the past few years, uh, the Western countries was dominating, in, especially in Latin America, Africa and all. But this time, China has successfully showed showcased that, that they are the alternative, and China is always there and ready to assist, being a reliable partner uh, in, in terms of economy, in terms of health assistance. Uh, so it has showed a successful alternative for the world, especially the participating countries that they are here to support uh, as uh, as an alternative power for the Western uh, world. So. This has eventually created the acceptance among in, in, in the global south. For example, according to the ABBA uh, uh, report, it has assisted around 300 million US dollars to the Philippines and 180 dollars uh, to Sri Lanka. And this list has been started growing on and on and on. Uh, and the donation list has been started growing up uh, with dozens of the West to support the uh, global South. Meantime, this has influenced the Chinese periphery, especially the global South, to tighten their uh, existing relationship with the countries and to support all the uh, other needs of these countries via engaging in the health cooperation. And China considers this as a problem-solving tool in terms of becoming the political engagement of the world. So this is one of the diagrams which I picked uh, from Hanuki. Um, this shows that China exported its 48 percent of vaccines to the uh, uh, as it uh, exported to the world, especially to the global south. And this is one of the uh, pictures with one of the maps which indicates how China has conquered the uh, periphery of South China Sea, which is one of the crisis uh, um, oriented uh, territory from Chinese perspective and the other West perspective. So China has started supporting the Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia and Philippines, which are mostly controversially involved in this uh, South China Sea. So by donating and conducting effective Chinese health cooperation into these countries, China was ensuring their footprints in these countries, especially hold their uh, uh, their presence uh, in health assistance form. Uh, this is one of the other uh, I would like to show where it, it, it indicates where uh, Iran and uh, Angola 
and Sudan are the main donors of uh, pumping uh, oil to uh, Chinese uh, existing uh, economic development. So China start, have successfully started securing all these plays, especially the Africa and the Middle Eastern parts by supporting, uh, by providing health assistance to these countries where it, it secures its health, I mean, sorry, uh, it secures its oil flow to China, which is one of the main source of uh, uh, ingredient for their uh, economic development. And this is, as I would like to show, this is a comparative analysis where uh, for, uh, uh, five country shows uh, the Chinese health cooperation throughout the, the global south and on the other part the US military present. So what I would like to say is here, China has almost uh, uh, started presenting all of these countries wherever China, uh, US military is being uh, deployed in the world, especially in the global south. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is another dimension of uh, Chinese health cooperation where it started a pumping to COVAX program and China is the second donor to the COVAX program by contributing per person to COVAX program but other than that China is also the tired with UNICEF and other UN bodies to distribute vaccines and other PPE measures to the countries who are in need during COVID-19 pandemic and in conclusion I would like to say that one of the main point of view is like you have to create acceptance. You have to make sure that your presence is available um, to conquer and become a hegemon. So China used this health cooperation as a means of uh, a tool of uh, becoming a health uh, donor as well as an alternative a power to the Western world to showcase that China is capable of becoming an hegemony, especially by playing a vital role in the global south, which was mostly and widely neglected by the uh, Western power, power policy. And uh, the Chinese, uh, the acceptance for Chinese leadership and its institutionalization of health cooperation showcases that uh, most of the health, uh, most of the health needs have been addressed uh, during COVID-19 uh, pandemic by China, especially in the global south, which, which gives you a uh, sort of uh, acceptance and reliability uh, from the participating states' point of view to engage in political and diplomatic relations with China. And this gives China a ban where China is using all these uh, soft powers to conquer the world. And uh, all of these showcases that China is using political uh, China is using the health cooperation as part as means of state centric extroverted cooperation as grand strategy to protect political hegemony in the long run to achieve their the strength to become political uh, hegemon of the world. And these are the references that I have used. And this is one of, this would be one of the examples where you can uh, use soft power means rather than hard power means to conquer the world or like influence other countries to secure their influence in other worlds. And we know we need not to use hard power necessarily to become an instrument or to attain the world. Uh, if you have any questions, thank you, Anusha. We really have to stop there, Anusha, because today 10 minutes has become elastic. We are stretching 10 okay. minutes today. We don't seem to have a track of time today. So we really have to stop okay. there now and go to our next speaker who's joining us, who is Major Jayatilaka, who is going to be speaking on achieving national security and sustainability of Sri Lanka in the integration of the role of lawfare and warfare for contemporary armed operations. Mitch Jayatilaka, I really need to request that we stick to 10 minutes. None of our presenters have stuck to 10 minutes. Uh, we think we have no understanding of what 10 is uh, because uh, we need to go on with the program. So we invite you to start presenting now. Uh, am I on board? 
Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yes, you are. Uh, hi, sorry. Let me say good morning to all of you in the University of Barca in Finland. Uh, a warm greeting from Finland, uh, University of Barca. Uh, good morning, and my fellow professors. Let me convey my appreciation to the conference chair for the conference to the Russian Embassy, which was very uh, good. Let me present my paper on the institution of the beauty of the national institution of the law. Law care and law care for the every arms operation to be covered there. Both high warfare and legal issues are forms of contestation. Contestation can be physical or symbol. Legal arguments or claims are one of the types of legal contestation. It was a very important reason why we did the conversation of the Russian intervention uh, to the United uh, European uh, Union. And it was a vital factor that we should be discussed in the Finland context in the international business arena. And any particular conflict that may play out on multiple points at once. And a move of these advantages to a force on the board and the disadvantages on the board. The legal battlefield is largely a single functional arena. We may refer to the legal activities that oppose, undermine, or substitute for other types of warfare and warfare. And we don't specially capacity to support, also undermine, or substitute. This paper will focus to explore the knowledge interpretation and integration of warfare and warfare on contemporary military operations for the national security and sustainable development of Sri Lanka. The world leader influences possess a large scale of power instrumenting the national power in legal strategy in terms of their global state. These realities are very seen as law and body that law of armed conflict, human rights law, and trade law as among the United States. I will say the pillar of the integration strategy of lawfare and warfare that based on the state. Sri Lanka military is concerned and protecting highly industry operations, yet the protection of equal levels of competency, integration of law, will only be success in contemporary operations. As indicated in the diagram, the large scale legal power instrumenting the national power in the US strategy will have been born of the massive legal arena in the case of the other states. I suggest the following law care integration model for Sri Lanka military, where it depicts the military's must be imaging the legal strategy in changing the functions, forms, and logics of modern law care. Especially when it is illustrated. The Australian Commentary is a symbol of the Indian past human trading operation and deals with the multiple solving problems demanded by Nokia in contemporary operations that Sri Lanka has been focused basically. The aims of focuses and the incidents of the study are as follows. The integration of Nokia and Nokia will be a strategic long-term mission that requires a high level of evidence for research and outside staff. The study was conducted in a qualitative approach in the review of 86 research papers by Meta Industry Center, followed by Meta University in society and critical literature analysis, selected by 586 related papers and 256 papers in its full contemporary. The study finds the following vital results. The following main novel categories in complementary findings are further research of integration of lawfare and warfare for military operations in Sri Lanka. The research introduces a vital subject of strategic denial or withdrawal in lawfare. The question is not whether it is a pure physical process. It is, but rather whether it is a practical possibility in particular situations in Sri Lanka. This apparently was not the case when Russia decided to separate Sri Lanka. 
much like your opponent have found a way to threaten high cost in the effect of forcing Russia to defend the full football. Operational demand in warfare determines the greater rules that are simply decreased, justified, and also maintaining consistent with the rule of law. However, we must counter not in the any access and sources of misinformation of this opinion. It is the one reason why the role of public diplomacy program is important for Sri Lanka. Material behind this warfare, China has recently sold a specific support of all other earth materials using high-tech goods and weapons systems to make the weapons more expensive for its competitors to produce. As challenge China perception in WTO as illegal restrictions on trade and were successfully in eliminating China's eliminated restrictions. What did we learn from Power of Lawfare. To answer the question of how we can measure the power of Lawfare and the other instruments, it has a useful tool to facilitate the question of how logical and legal institutions can be modified to be more effective and integration with international legal power and peer building for metasynthesis creates to promote the knowledge and executive analysis of the three legal files. As we have further, the national security and sustainability can be achieved by protecting the integration with lawfare and bring out basic conceptual expectations and the study was made in China with the reconceptualization of the military warfare into the subsection of a lawfare in the aim for unreasoning such non-mystical concepts should be more in integration with the warfare and lawfare. I consider and I understand the actual combat operations in sophisticated military forces Role of engagement and targeting mission are often elevated by legal elements. But I wonder how much more expensive for the integration of lawfare command with the scientific commands might be in Sri Lanka. The following is a list of areas which are integrated legal components may improve strategic and tactical outcomes to the operation. The findings of this research are such that we may understand lawfare as a modern situation in international transportation, a growing availability of use and from their use of law of supplement or substitute for military operations. The lawfare strategy will examine the extent to which lawfare can be effective against a particular target in particular context, where it is integrated. New versatile Sri Lankan military force that is able to fight with the multi weaponry in any domain of war as a challenge in front. Finally, the sun continues in the future research possibility of novel interpretations towards achieving national security and sustainability of Sri Lanka in the integration of role of lawfare and warfare for contemporary military operations in consideration of factors regarding in this time. The vital references are as usual. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Thank you. for your presentation. Okay, let us now move to the Q&A session. So we've heard from six speakers who have taken us through an assortment of topics, some connected, um, under the theme of global trends. Uh, the floor is now open. Who would like to speak? Please go ahead and tell us who you would like to pose your question to. The families will be more than happy to answer your question. Crystal clear. 
Okay. Um, so the next one is uh, it's been a, it's been a rather uh, intellectually stimulating session to listen to all of you uh, in terms of what you spoke about. Uh, whether it was in terms of the compulsions externally from Sri Lanka's social economic crisis. Uh, Sri was a pains to explain the need for rescheduling restructuring of debt, how we would go about doing that. Thina, you brought in that component of smart power there, which is interesting. We want to understand the hard power concept, how that comes into play. Um, Major Patrena was talking about peacekeeping. And I guess we have an internal challenge to overcome first uh, in terms of uh, a barrier that comes up internationally. Uh, Anusha was talking about the whole role played uh, in terms of health diplomacy and the potential for hegemonic power. Uh, once again, we need to understand the relationship as to how we can use health diplomacy. Is that sufficient for political hegemony? And that's an area to go into. And also looking at lawfare and warfare and how this is becoming extremely relevant uh, as presented to us by Major Jatilaka. So I think we will wrap up the session at that point. Some questions, some, they have some questions. Oh, you do? Oh, please go ahead. Please. Tell me, who would you like to ask? Uh, actually, I would like to ask a question from Professor Shihan. Yes, please. Uh, since uh, you have uh, spoken about uh, the role of the community, how do you think Australian measures uh, will have adverse consequences in Sri Lanka's near future? I uh, specifically talking about austerity measures, but I intend to emphasize the fact that uh, the conditions are imposed by the IMF. So, uh, in terms of fulfilling those conditions, there is a possibility that those conditions have, could have some adverse effects on the general public. For example, in terms of uh, employment and reducing the state employment within Sri Lanka, so that might essentially be a violation of the fundamental right of the citizen. So that is where the legal framework comes into play. And that is where we have to have the legal knowledge and also the constitutional knowledge to ensure that none of the rights are violated at any cost. That is why I mentioned that economic redemption is important, but it should not be at the cost of the rights of the common man. So if we are at all to the opposing of the education, that should be fair and most of all basic. I suppose it answer it. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, I'm Jinnam uh, uh, Chetli Gerard from uh, Intech 39. I'm a first year undergraduate from English Relations. So, my question is more to upgrade uh, Shanahabs as well. So, sir, uh, so you have explained about the uh, current situation of uh, the country in Sri Lanka and uh, the role of uh, international organizations and uh, regional uh, and regions as well. So they all come under international community. So there are other nations like China. So they are trying to invest in Sri, inside Sri Lanka like project uh, policy. So sir, uh, what are the uh, what are their, uh, what are their roles and the possible ways uh, to exploit this uh, contemporary situation inside Sri Lanka uh, in their favor? Uh, that is what I intended in terms of uh, the economic redemption that right, is the possibility for, to assist or to exploit. Uh, giving specific attention to the debt trap debt diplomacy that I highlighted throughout my presentation. Uh, there are a lot of talks, it has been a controversy, but it's important to understand without facts and figures it's not okay for us to arrive at assumptions or conclusions. But what I would like to mention specifically in regard to your question is that Investment is extremely preferable and without foreign direct investment in the near future, Sri Lanka is not going to end up where it tends to end up. Maybe in the long term, maybe in the short term. That is important, but again, this is where the legal knowledge and legal framework comes into play. We have to be mindful and thoughtful as to how we entertain foreign direct investment. And if at all we entertain, what regulations do we impose? And it's not a matter of imposing lot of regulations and making sure we are you know like putting them through a lot of pressure. It's it, we have to find the middle path theory, not the dependency theory, not the classical theory. It has to be the middle path theory. We are we are open for the investment, but at the same time we ensure that the rights of our people are recognized. And it's not definitely at the cost of the rights of our people that we encourage uh, foreign direct investment. I believe that answers your question here.
Yes, please go ahead. So I want to ask this uh, question from Mr. Gandhi. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, when it comes to sports diplomacy, that it should be brought about as a separate policy as well. We it's not connected to uh, public diplomacy uh, in contrast. And also I just want to connect two questions. Uh, first thing is, uh, now we know that states can leverage international sports events to strengthen their international relations with other countries. And also in that context, if we consider Sri Lanka in specific, how can Sri Lanka in this modern contemporary situation employ more of sports diplomacy in order to go ahead with its foreign policy? Thank you. Yes, uh, to answer your first question, what, what I meant as a point to reflect is sports diplomacy should be considered as a separate policy uh, rather than the traditional component we are uh, where sports is a notion where we think that it should it comes under uh, the realm of di uh, diplomacy as a cultural or traditional component that's what, what I meant that sports can be separated from that notion of perception that it's a soft power, it's cultural diplomacy where I point out uh, because sports can also be perceived as a hard power. Uh, that's why I meant that it should be separated from this notion of soft power or culture or tradition that uh, we of seeing sports. So I believe that answers your first question. Uh, second question, yes, uh, in terms of Sri Lanka, what I feel is uh, First, we need to understand the strategic environment we are in and also what I believe is we need to identify because there are certain sports which Sri Lanka compete and which we excel on. Let's say like the best example is cricket and as well, well as a netball in the current context and uh, what uh, we can, uh, uh, what we can process, we should always promote sports as well as the sporting personalities as a way of bringing in now at this point uh, the biggest crisis we are facing uh, is the economic crisis uh, and through sports we can always promote investment and uh, I'm not uh, completely uh, clear that Sri Lanka is in a position to host sporting events at the time but uh, but even posting sporting events uh, can bring in more franchise TV rights those are the ways we can address uh, in terms of the current crisis but uh, uh, but to your answer as a whole the issue I point out in this research is the problem is there needs to be further investigation done so that sports diplomacy is is still in that bottom, you know, the last few uh, co components of di 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 diplomacy where we haven't still identified the potential. So that's something we should reflect on, and this research will hopefully provide uh, that moving forward because we have so much of the potential to move forward with, and we should uh, think about. That. Yes. Any other questions? Right, so thank you. Thank you um, to all of our presenters, uh, those who joined us online and those who are present physically for taking trouble. You've put a lot of thought into what you have prepared, uh, whether it was your abstract, whether it was your presentation. Uh, in terms of reflecting on areas which, as you just now mentioned, can in a way they reflect further understanding, further reflection on it, whether it's from an economic point of view and where we have to think practically in terms of where we are right now, um, whether we're looking at options, opportunities that we have, as uh, Major Patran also mentioned, where we should be looking at some of the great opportunities that we have out there, and using that keyword of opportunities. 
whether it's looking at other countries and the roles they are playing, or looking at some of the more modern concepts that I've talked about. This is something that we can all think about and start using in the future. So, thank you once again. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you for joining us. And we will end the session there. Over to you. Thank you, sir. That was a very interesting and fruitful discussion. And I believe we will all leave this forum with much food for thought. I would like to once again thank the chairperson, Dr. George Cook, for gracing the 15th International Research Conference with his presence among his fellows. I would also like to thank the authors of second technical session for defense and strategic studies, Dr. Bhagya Senaratna, Officer Cadet Shihan Maharuf, Mr. Dinan Galapati, Major Indira Bhatirana, Ms. Anusha Raja, and Major Chandan Jatilakar for sharing their thoughts on the theme Global Trends. Now, I would like to call upon Deputy Dean, Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, Colonel Maitri Khandekubura, accompanied by Major Hussein Sharif, to present the token of appreciation to Dr. George Cook, the Chair of the Technical Session on Global Trends. The fourth technical session for defense and strategic studies at the Fijiya's Auditorium at 1 p.m. Therefore, I request your physical or online participation via the relevant link for the next session. Thank you.